As someone who has uh, served in elected, uh, held elected office in all three levels of government in Canada, I often get asked what it was that took me into politics. And sometimes I joke and say that it must have been a recessive gene. But actually, I think the example of my parents was very important. Both served in the military in World War II. My dad was in the Canadian Army where he fought in Italy. And my mother horrified her mother by joining the Navy and becoming a wireless operator Wren in the Women's, Canadian, the, the Women's Royal Canadian Naval Service. As I grew up, I also wanted to make some kind of contribution to making the world a better place. And happily, we weren't at war, so politics was the way that I chose to try and make a contribution. And even in my post-political life, I've been involved in organizations focused on the promotion of democracy, the advancement of women, peace issues, and most recently, climate change. And it's the last issue that makes me feel rather helpless. Because although the issues are so important and the stakes are so high, the lack of political will to take the measures that we need to protect our planet for the future uh, are very discouraging. So when I received a call in the spring of 2022 inviting me to join a global commission on climate overshoot, I was quite intrigued. The call came from a man named Pascal Lamy, whom I'd met many years before. He was a European diplomat, and he served two terms as Director General of the World Trade Organization, and he was somebody that I quite respected. So I said to him, what is climate overshoot and why does it need a commission? Well, he reminded me that in the Paris Climate Agreement of 2015, the countries of the Earth aimed to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. But he said, I'm sorry, but there was a growing consensus among all of the bodies that were monitoring the Paris Accords that we were, in fact, headed to an overshoot of that limit. And what that means is by overshoot is going temporarily above the goal and hopefully coming back down, but there's no guarantee that we would return to the goal that we had set. He said that overshoot raises very serious issues and that there was no single body in the world at the time that was addressing the question of what an overshoot would mean and how we needed to understand it. So our commission of 14 high-level former heads of state and government and ministers and high-level scientific advisors would work to create a report that we would deliver in the fall of 2023 to try and understand what global, what climate overshoot means and how to deal with it. Now, you won't be surprised to know that in the world of climate debate, language can often be very sensitive and often very political. And I remember in the days when we used to talk about mitigation, meaning reducing uh, carbon dioxide emissions, and also adaptation, helping societies and, and uh, communities adapt to climate change, that a lot of people felt that they didn't want to talk about adaptation. They were afraid that that would distract attention and resources from the primary goal of actually limiting global warming. And so it was interesting that our overshoot commission also got a kind of semantic pushback from people who said, why are you focusing on overshoot? That's a failure. We should be focusing on meeting the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit on warming. But the reality is that we are on track to overshoot that limit. Climate simulations show that to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius with no overshoot, global carbon dioxide emissions from human resources, human sources rather, must decline by about 45% from 2010 levels by 2030. And we must have, get into net zero emissions, no net addition of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere by 2050. But currently, however, we are on track to reach 2.5 degrees Celsius warming by the end of this century, by 2100. If we overshoot 1.5 by missing the 2030 emissions target, we need to give serious consideration to what that will mean. And I was reminded of the American physicist Herman Kahn's 1962 book about nuclear war called Thinking About the Unthinkable. Now, Herman, had, Herman Kahn had no interest in living through a nuclear war, but he thought if you didn't study it and understand what it might mean, if you didn't understand how one might be started and what protection governments could offer to their populations, it was very irresponsible. We needed to know what we were dealing with. 
And I think what we're doing with Climate Overshoot is trying to direct people's attention to things that are really quite unthinkable, and at the very least, extremely worrisome, in order to create a broader understanding of the reality and what the implications might be. One of the first implications, of course, will be a greater necessity to provide resources for adaptation. Now, every year, the UN Climate Conference hosts a conference of the parties called the COP in order to review the progress that countries have made in reaching their climate goals. The Paris Agreement was made at COP21, for example. At the COP27 meeting last year in Egypt, the expression loss and damage was for the first time accepted into the dialogue to express the obligation of the big emitter countries to provide resources to those countries, especially those in the global south, who were not emitters, but were nonetheless experiencing some of the worst effects of global warming. They needed resources to adapt and to protect their societies. While limiting greenhouse gas emissions severely is the only hope to limit further warming, another challenge we have is to remove existing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And there are many approaches to this carbon dioxide removal, or CDR, as it's sometimes called. There are some called biological CDR methods, and they rely on things like afforestation and the growth of plants with the capacity to absorb and sequester carbon dioxide. For example, growing kelp in the ocean and letting it sink to the bottom. Kelp will absorb carbon, and then it can sink to the bottom of the ocean, is one of the approaches has been suggested. But these are often called the green solutions, uh, growing things to sequester carbon. But there are also what are sometimes called chrome solutions, the industrial techniques, such as direct air capture. And this is where, for example, carbon dioxide that goes up a chimney in an industrial process is captured and redirected into the earth, into a, a salt mine or an old oil well or someplace where it can be kept out of the atmosphere. But the bottom line is that we really do not have a technology that enables us to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere at scale. And so continued investment in tech research and development to find such technologies will be extremely important. But other technologies are being developed that could be described as climate interventions or geoengineering. And they include mechanisms that are technologies to actually cool the planet. And two of these are particularly interesting. One is called marine brightening, marine cloud brightening. And it builds on the existing effect that you see in the clouds over major shipping lanes in the Earth, where the exhaust from the ships gets into the clouds and has an effect on the reflectivity of the sun. So scientists and engineers are working at creating a harmless, non-polluting form of addition to the clouds. And salt from seawater is what they're experimenting with now to see if they can increase the reflectivity of these clouds and cool the air underneath them. It's still in the research development phase, and there's no workable technology yet, and there's certainly no guarantee that the concerns about its negative effects can be overcome. Another technology builds on the experience with volcanoes. In 1991, when Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines erupted, it sent massive amounts of sulfur aerosols into the stratosphere, and they created a haze around the world that cooled the Earth by about one half a degree Celsius for a period of a little over a year. So scientists are wondering whether it would be possible to engage in solar radiation modification, or SRM as it's called, to temporarily cool the Earth while we are engaging in other efforts to reduce our carbon emissions. SRM and other technologies of geoengineering are extremely controversial. And SRM is still in its research phase. But there are some climate activists who are so hostile to it that they think it shouldn't be researched, the government should not provide, provide funding for it, and that there should be no intellectual property rights uh, established for any research that might be done. So all of these issues are really contentious. And we don't know if any of these technologies should be deployed. And what makes it particularly difficult is that there is no governance structure in the world to deal with these technologies and the kinds of decisions that need to be made about them. Who would decide what are the risks that we should take? Or whether these technologies should or could be deployed? Who will evaluate the science and weigh the harms and benefits that any of these technologies could bring? 
So we have a huge gap in governance to help us deal with the possibility or desirability of using or not using any of these technologies. Climate overshoot will have political significance as well because it will be a dramatic indication of our collective failure to act. It's not clear whether that will be seen as a defeat or whether it will encourage people and countries to redouble their efforts to try and achieve that 1.5 degrees Celsius warming goal, even if it has to be done after an overshoot for a period of time. But as people contemplate the dangers of increased temperature rise, their appetite for risk might also change. People may decide to tolerate a level of risk that's quite inconsistent with what we know about some of the technologies that might be proposed to cool the earth or to change it in some way to meet the problems of warming. And so the Climate Overshoot Commission is preparing its report for this fall, will be released in September of 2023, to try and clarify some of these issues and contribute to a dialogue that we will help, we hope will help us in a sound and responsible way to deal with the possibility of climate overshoot. Of course, our primary priority is still to meet the 1.5 degrees Celsius warming limit by mitigation, but we're not on track to do that. And we hope that perhaps our report will somehow draw attention to the need to redouble our efforts to do just that. But what can we all do? Well, first of all, we should keep the metaphor of overshoot to commit ourselves to returning to 1.5 degrees Celsius warming limit rather than giving, up, giving in to an inevitably, inevitably hotter world if, in fact, we overshoot that limit. We should all cut our own emissions and encourage policymakers to take aggressive action. As citizens, we should encourage our governments at all levels to promote innovation, and whether it's light-colored paving stones in urban areas to reduce the heat that would normally be attracted by dark, uh, dark pavements, or humane and thoughtful and innovative approaches to redirecting employment, for helping people to move from industries that are no longer consistent with our climate goals and moving into green economy industries. For example, in Scotland, people who were working in the offshore oil rigs are now working in the big offshore wind farm installations where many of the same skills are being used and similar employment can be offered. Now, the transitions will not be easy for everybody, but I think it's really important that we approach this challenge in a humane and creative way in order to have support for our, our climate change goals. No one really wants to think about climate overshoot. As with Herman Kahn's study of nuclear war, the dangers of unconstrained global warming are really unthinkable. We need to learn more about the challenges that still face us in trying to change, uh, change uh, the climate by emissions alone and the growing likelihood of overshoot and the additional means to reduce risks such as adaptation, carbon dioxide removal, and the most perplexing tools like solar radiation modification. We need to ensure that the unthinkable does not become the inevitable. People often ask me now, what are you up to? And I answer that I'm trying to be a good ancestor. I think about the lessons that I learned from my parents. In speaking about his war service, my dad used to say, we weren't heroes. We just knew that there was a job that had to be done. And I think climate change is the job for our generation, although we will not feel its worst effects. My small involvement in the Climate Overshoot Commission has helped me feel a little less helpless, and I hope it will help me be part of something that clarifies some possibilities and choices and is a tile in the mosaic of a better world for future generations. I think we all should try to be the ancestors that future generations deserve. Thank you.